Everybody, this is going to be 5.5, Differences Between the North and the South Grow. And we're going to start with a quote from Alexis de Tocqueville, the Frenchman who visited America and wrote extensively about it. And he said, on the north bank of the Ohio, the Ohio River, that is, everything is activity, industry, labor is honored, there are no slaves. Pass to the south bank and the scene changes so suddenly that you think yourself on the other side of the world. The enterprising spirit is gone. Our objectives, we are going to analyze why industrialization took root in the northern part of the United States, not the south, describe the impact of industrialization on northern life, and analyze the reasons that agriculture and slavery became more prominent in the south. So let's look at industrialization in the north. So Democratic Republicans like Thomas Jefferson, I've said this before, saw America as a nation of farmers, yeoman farmers, self-sustaining uh, small family farmers across the country. However, by the early part of the 1800s, America was split between farming in the South and mechanical industry in the North. So thanks to Jefferson's embargo uh, during the War of 1812 and the War of 1812 itself, America started making and buying more of its own stuff. Mo most manufacturing was done in the Northeast thanks to the, the factories set up by Samuel Slater and Mr. Lowell, uh, Francis Cabot Lowell. Um, and after the War of 1812, Congress actually passed a tariff to uh, keep Americans buying American goods, the Tariff of 1816. Now, a tariff is a tax on foreign goods. Uh, and this was great for American manufacturers. However, it was very bad for farmers because they had to pay high prices for American-made consumer goods uh, during this time, and farmers were feeling the pinch a little bit. Most factories were in the Northeast for a couple reasons. First of all, there's more startup money, what we will call capital. Secondly, because the South's climate was better for farming while the North was better for uh, factories because they had the rivers to sort of help turn the wheels in a factory. And lastly, the Northeast had cheaper labor thanks to the fact that lots of new immigrants were moving into the American Northeast. So here's what a Lowell Mill looks like, uh, along with the city that's growing up around it. Now, let's, let's see how it changes Northern society. Many workers in the North found their lives very deeply changed by the Industrial Revolution. We talked about how you started living your life on the clock, not on the, uh, the sun. Uh, one big example of this are skilled laborers, people who used to make everything by hand. Now the factories are taking away those skilled labor jobs, uh, which meant that skilled workers were not as necessary. Now, some laborers thought that the best way to keep themselves necessary was to organize into labor unions and fight for their jobs. Um, they also um, formed political parties and ran for office in order to do the same thing, and they formed labor unions. Uh, labor unions when a group of workers bands together to demand better pay and better working conditions. And unions would do things like go on strike. They would stop working. They would force employers to pay higher wages. Uh, they would try to reduce working hours, or they would try to improve working conditions. Meanwhile, female laborers were going on strike too, including Lowell girls who went on strike after the owners cut their wages while at the same time increasing their rent that was due. So factory owners fought against this by uh, saying that unions were an illegal conspiracy and they, they sued the unions and took them to court. And oftentimes the uh, factory owners won this fight. Now, some workers were helped by industrialization, though we see the rise of a larger middle class during this time. We see white-collar workers like bankers and lawyers and accountants becoming uh, more prominent during this time and more wealthy. The middle class was not as com uh, were not common laborers, I'm sorry, they were more educated, uh, but they also weren't the super upper class either. They were not the hugely wealthy. So they were well off. They, they could do well for themselves. Middle-class men also usually worked outside the home in offices, um, and then they started to sort of say, like, well, I've got the money to move out of the city, and the city where a lot of the factories are, so I'm going to move just outside the city into suburbs. Uh, earliest suburbs were being formed at this time. And this often separated neighborhoods by social class. Um, so the wealthy people moved out of town, the poor people still lived in town. Meanwhile, middle-class women were expected to stay at home. This is what's called the cult of domesticity. Um, Working-class women did not have that luxury, though, and went to work in the factories because that was the only thing that they could do. 
So here is the, uh, this is also known as the sphere of woman, otherwise known as the cult of domesticity, that a woman's place is in the home, raising the kids, uh, teaching them how to be very good um, model American Republican, small r Republican citizens, uh, working for the Republic. Now, by the 1840s, most middle-class workers had been born in America. However, we start to see the rise of immigration in the 1840s as well. Um, and they're from new places and with new religions, too. In the 1840s and 50s, you see immigration go through the roof in America. So, uh, most of these new immigrants were coming from Ireland uh, and uh, from Germany, where they were being uh, pushed out by religious persecution, by the Irish potato famine, and by political and economic problems. So in Ireland, we had the potato famine, the, the fungus that destroyed most of their food. And hundreds of thousands, perhaps even a million Irish people starved to death. Uh, after this happened, many, many Irish people fled to America. About the same time, Germany was having a huge failed political revolution, and so both came to America during this time. And you see immigrant cities in America in the 1850s. You might notice that St. Louis has a big dot in it. That's because many Irish and many German people came to live in St. Louis, including the Anheusers and the Bush family as well. So many of these new immigrants were either Catholic or Jewish, which were not the regular Protestant uh, groups that were expected in America. And so most immigrants were kind of mistrusted due to their religion. Also, a lot of these immigrants got jobs in manual labor or as servants. They were not getting the high-class jobs. However, by 1860, immigrants made up a huge chunk of big cities like New York. They also moved to the Midwest. Uh, since they didn't have as many opportunities in the South, they mostly moved to the Midwest. Now, immigrant workers were also... Um, not welcomed with open arms because they took the lowest paying jobs, oftentimes fighting against free African Americans uh, and also the poor white people in northern cities. And sometimes this would turn into riots and violence. Uh, American born Protestants did not like these new Irish Catholic immigrants coming into their places. Um, Catholics had been mistrusted forever since before, the, uh, during the Protestant Reformation. And so there was a lot of anti-immigrant feelings and sentiment at this time, especially from groups known as nativists. That's an important term. They're not against Native Americans. They are against uh, new immigrants coming into America, and they were calling for legislation that would limit immigration. Many uh, immigrants eventually joined the Democratic Party in order to have some sort of political power and defend their rights. So uh, they actually basically partied up in order to make sure that they wouldn't get pushed around. So here's a sign, uh, help wanted, no Irish need apply. This is from Boston in the early 20th century, actually. And here is a, uh, an anti-Irish and anti-German uh, political cartoon where the Irish guy and the German guy are stealing the ballot box. Um, new Americans stealing the votes, basically. Now, let's look at agriculture in the South. Since the 1870s, slavery had been actually decreasing in the South, especially in the Mid-South. Um, however, you still saw it uh, a lot in the Deep South. Um, and it changed after cotton became a massive crop in the South. Cotton is what saved slavery for a number of decades. Several things led to this increase, and the biggest thing is the invention of the cotton gin, which was a device by Eli Whitney to very quickly uh, separate the hard-to-pick-out seeds out of cotton fluff. Uh, and this turned cotton into a huge crop, with hundreds of millions of pounds of cotton being produced every year. Suddenly, um, there was a giant demand for cotton. And so this is the cotton gin. Basically, you turn the crank, uh, the cotton falls on one side, the seeds fall on the other side. This increase in production also led to an increase in slavery. Um, most farmers uh, were... Uh, saw the demand for cotton and said, great, we're going to need more enslaved people to uh, pick the cotton and put it through the cotton gin. Also, as more farmers are spreading to newly opened areas in the southeast and to the west, uh, slavery was traveling with them. This raised a few eyebrows. People were worried that slavery might go all the way to the west coast once we got out there. Lastly, we see industry in the north needed raw materials like cotton, and so the north and the south were sort of partnering up. There, there, weren't, there wasn't much slavery in the North, but they still partnered up with slavery 
um, in order to make cheaply made cotton in the South. So here's a cotton plantation before the Civil War. Now, while federal law banned the introduction of new slaves from Africa in 1808, enslaved people were still secretly being shipped into America, and also um, they were being sold from middle America to the deep south. Uh, enslaved people are also sometimes being sold just to have children and increase the enslaved population. And so we see during this time the, the boom of cotton that the number of enslaved people rises from 1.5 million to 4 million. Uh, we also see some states where enslaved people actually outnumbered free men. Now, since cotton was the main crop of the South, as long as cotton was doing well, everything was fine. However, if prices fell, uh, it would damage the entire South, and that could happen. Uh, also, since most plantations were really big, most of the South was farms. There were very few big cities because most of the South is just these gigantic cotton plantations. One of the few big cities is New Orleans, Charleston, South Carolina, um, Atlanta and Augusta in Georgia, um, or uh, Savannah. Uh, most immigrants, however, were settling in the North uh, because the North had a much higher population. Um, they were able to get factory jobs in the North, and they were not welcome in the South. So we see a lot more immigrants settling in the North, not the South. Now, the number of enslaved people and poor whites in the South also meant that illiteracy was high. Uh, many people in the South could not read. And although slavery was central to the idea of the Southern sort of mindset of where they were, actually most Southerners could not afford enslaved people. Um, they kind of eked out a living in the mountains in the far West. They were not uh, able to have these gigantic plantations. However, most Southerners did defend slavery, hoping that one day they would be able to afford it, and also realizing that as long as enslaved people were at the bottom of the social ladder, uh, they always had somebody below them. Southern white men also, like I said, saw themselves as more free than their northern counterparts. Um, uh, the people who worked on farms said that they were not uh, beholden to the, the bell and the whistle of the factory, that they had more individuality because of this. Many people in the South at this time stopped calling slavery a necessary evil, um, and they started saying that slavery was in fact a positive net good for the South. Um, they said that slavery was kinder to African Americans than factory work. Uh, we also see that people were using the Bible during this time to defend slavery. 